one thing that we always swore that we would do as pastors is we would always ensure that God's presence was our priority and that we would never allow our own plans or our agendas or, or um, our own outlines to get in the way of who he is and what he wants to do. So we never make any apologies for that. Amen. We want him to accomplish his will because, because you've come into this place in a, um, in a particular condition uh, your life is in a particular season and only God knows that. O- only God knows what you need. God knows what you need to experience. He knows what you need to hear from him. He knows what you need to feel in his presence. And our greatest prayer is that there's not anything that we would say that would greatly impact you, but that there's something you would experience from the, the one and true living God that you would experience him in a real way because one second in the presence of God can change everything in your entire life. And so God's presence has and always will be our priority above and beyond everything else. It is about God. It is not about Mount Movers Church. It's not about Brad and Misty. It's about him. It's about Jesus. And so today, guys, we have like, we have some content to get into. Some of you guys really enjoy studying the word of God. You enjoy uh, going deep and knowing uh, some of the mysteries of God and some of the things that God, um, you know, doesn't show uh, a lot of uh, people through his word, only for those that are really hungry. But we have, we have a really good message for you today that is so timely. And I just want to encourage you um, as we jump into this to really pay attention because we're going to move extremely fast. We're going to move at warp speed and we're going to blow your face off with scriptures. And you're not going to even have time to take notes. So I encourage you, if you're watching online, you can take notes later. You're not going to be able to keep up. If you're in the room, you're just going to have to go back and watch the broadcast um, because we have a lot of heavy meat to share with you uh, today. And so let's just get right into it and let's cover as much ground as we possibly can. We've been in a series called Let's Grow Already. And today we want to cover uh, part four. And the title of today's message is Live on Guard. Live on Guard. Okay, now to the meat. Uh, something very important is coming this weekend. It is a huge Jewish holiday known as Rosh Hashanah. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of that, Rosh Hashanah. Okay, many of you might be thinking, what the heck is that? What does it mean? Another name for it is the Feast of Trumpets. And this holiday is significant because it has massive prophetic implications. It's one of seven feast days. Uh, that God has laid out throughout scripture for the nation of Israel. And each feast has a huge prophetic event tied to it. So let me say it this way. There's seven feasts, highly important, that are celebrated annually. It's like we celebrate Christmas every year. The Jewish people have holidays that they celebrate every single year. But they're more than just holidays. They're actually prophetic Um, visual aids, if you will, that God laid out over a period of thousands of years, where on each of these holidays, something massively prophetic and significant happened that revealed the person and the work of Jesus Christ and how he relates to us and how we relate to him. It is one of the coolest, most fascinating things. If you can bear with us and you can dig in and really pay attention, this will absolutely blow your mind. And by the end of this message, you got to be thinking to yourself, God's word is so powerful and so prophetic and so awesome and so bigger than we could ever imagine. And so let's get into it. In Leviticus chapter 23, God lays out these seven feasts. We don't have time to to really read all of that to you. But in verse 1, the Lord says that he is speaking to Moses. And he says, speak to the children of Israel and say to them. There's two things I want you to take right here. The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. All right, two things. Feasts are an appointed festival day. And a convocation is a dress rehearsal. That's what I really want you to pay attention to. Say dress rehearsal. rehearsal. All right, so the seven feasts, they were observed annually, like I said, but they were prophetic dress rehearsals of what was going to actually happen in the future. And so let's look at this chart really quick. 
So here are the seven feast days that are laid out. And as you can see, um, there are two seasons broken up between the seven feasts. The four first feasts and the spring holidays are Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost. And the last third happen in the fall season, and it's the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Day of Tabernacles. So just to prove to you and just to show you how fascinating and awesome this is. I'm going to very quickly just highlight each of the first four feasts that you see on this chart, and it's going to blow your minds to get ready. All right, so Passover, all right? If you, we did a whole series on this multiple times in the season around Easter where we explained Passover. Passover ended up being one day where the, the Jewish people would basically sacrifice a lamb, a spotless, innocent lamb, to cover the uh, sins of the people. And they, and they, they sacrificed these lambs, and then they, they basically would, they, they acknowledged this holiday for hundreds and hundreds of years until finally on that very day, on the day of Passover, Jesus was publicly sacrificed and put on display just like the lambs were the very same day at the very same hour that the lambs were sacrificed, Jesus being the sacrificial lamb. Behold, the lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world. He was sacrificed on the very day and the very hour that all of the lambs were sacrificed. sacrificed. Thus, he became the sacrificial lamb lamb on the day of Passover. Jesus was crucified that day. He became the Passover lamb and his blood being the perfect lamb of God didn't just cover our sins, but his blood washed our sins away indefinitely. You can give Jesus praise for that. Without Jesus, we had no hope. You understand that? The Feast of Unleavened Bread was instituted by God, and it reminded them how they had been delivered out of the land of Egypt. They were delivered out of slavery, out of a former life of bondage and slavery. And the picture here that he was trying to teach the children of Israel is that he wanted not to just deliver them out of bondage of slavery uh, physically, but he wanted to deliver all of us out of the bondage to sin spiritually. And Jesus fulfilled that on the day of unleavened bread, Jesus basically went to the grave and took all of our sins with him and he went to the grave and he became that prophetic fulfillment 1,500 years later when he was buried with our sins. Leavening in the bread represents uh, sin. And so he took our sins with him. And, and scripture says that he knew no sin, that he might become the righteousness of God. He took our sins to the tomb, delivered us out of slavery. And now we can only be found righteous because God went to the grave on our behalf and took our sins with him. On the Feast of first fruits, it was about returning the, the first and best of the barley harvest back to God with a wave offering. And the priest would take the first and the best uh, of, that, of that offering. He would give an offering back to God. It was the first of the best of that harvest. And therefore, God would bless uh, the entire harvest that year because of that first fruit offering being given back to God. So God would bless everything because of the first that was returned to him. Jesus, and check this out, Jesus became the first fruit offering himself when he was resurrected. Now, I want you to see this. We, we see Adam in the very beginning, and Adam basically initiates this humanity for the first time and uh, screws everything up, and now we're sinners, and now we're all just done, and we have no hope. But then here comes Jesus, and on the, day, on the feast of first fruits, when he's resurrected, he, he goes from the grave, from death. He reverses the curse, and he comes back to life, and he becomes that wave offering for us, meaning that God because God received him being perfect and spotless and sinless, he blessed the rest of the batch. And that means you and I get in on that because he was perfect. He became the second Adam. And now we have grace and hope and forgiveness in him because Jesus was the first fruit offering. And Jesus was resurrected on the very day of first fruits. Let's move to the last one. On the feast of Pentecost, they observed the completion of now the wheat harvest, not the barley, but the wheat harvest with another way of offering. And this time with two loaves of bread, one represented the Gentiles and one represented the Jews. 
in the days of, they didn't know that's what it represented, but that's what God meant by it. And it was made of fine wheat flour, meaning that Jesus would become our righteousness. And, and, and that wheat harvest, that offering was given back to God. And you and I now, because, of, because Jesus was glorified through that offering, he, he promised the release of the power of his sweet Holy Spirit to come. And he said in John 12 and 23, Jesus says, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new, of new lives. So the harvest represents represents all of those who don't know Jesus coming in and receiving him because Jesus became that fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, if you look out in the lobby after church today, you'll notice that the lobby concrete is full of wheat kernels. Ask a church member who's been here for a while how that got there. It's a miracle and it's just absolutely insane. But God has shown us prophetically through that wheat miraculously showing up that he is bringing people to this house to come to know him and Jesus is being glorified through it all. It's so cool. All right, so we see his power released. We see the promise in Acts 1 and 8 where Jesus said, I'm going to go, but after I go, I'm going to send the power and the promise of my Holy Spirit to come upon you, and I'm going to fill you and give you the power to go out and make me famous. In essence, that's my version, but that's what we're supposed to do with the power of his Holy Spirit. So here's what's really cool. I know I went through that really fast, but we see that Jesus became the fulfillment of each of these four holidays on that very day. On that very day, he became the fulfillment in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We see how he is the feast days. So we have these four feast days. Jesus fulfills them on each day. My question for you would be this. These are huge, significant events that were fulfilled in prophecy. I'm just asking common sense. We, don't, we, can't, we can't necessarily guarantee this, but let's just ask ourselves. If God did it before and fulfilled prophetically, revealing who he is through these four feast days, do you think he would stop for any reason and maybe say, you know what, the next three feast days aren't as important. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna do that on those next three days. Do you think he would do that? Or do you think he would probably continue the same pattern that he's been upholding for thousands of years? He might probably possibly fulfill prophetically himself, revealing himself to us through these next three days. So that causes us to ask the question, okay, well then what are the significance of these next three days? What does it mean to us? Well, let's start with this. There's three big end time prophetic events that have yet to take place. Three really, really big ones. And there's a lot of end time prophecies and things that will take place that we can read about all through different books of the Bible, but there's three really big ones that are very significant. That would be the rapture of the church. That means that Jesus promised in scripture multiple times that he would come back for the church and take them and receive them to himself and, and take us to heaven with him. There would be the second return of Christ, uh, which fits hand in glove with the battle of Armageddon. Okay, there's going to be a huge battle and Jesus is going to return a second time. Um, and then there's the millennial reign, which is where basically he gathers all of his people together at the end time harvest. And he establishes a kingdom here on earth for a thousand years and we will rule and reign with him. Three huge events. All right. Is it possible that God will unleash these three events on three, on these particular feast days? Well, if you were to look at what these days represent and what they mean historically and in tradition according to scripture, then it should reveal to us, okay, which event it might be tied to. So let's look at what is next, the Feast of Trumpets, and when is the Feast of Trumpets this year? So the Feast of Trumpets in 2023 is actually September 15th, starts at sundown, which would be this coming weekend, and it ends on September 17th at sundown. So it's a two-day feast, all right? Now, I wanna take you, if you're, I don't have time because we're, we're running short, but I wanna just tell you what's in our notes and you can study it for yourself. If you go to Matthew chapter 24, you're gonna see where Jesus sits down privately with his disciples and they ask him, will you tell us the signs of the end times? Give us a clue as to when all of these things he had been teaching, when the kingdom of God was gonna come to pass, when you're gonna come back. 
Well, in Matthew chapter 24, it goes through, and you've probably heard the statements, wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and all of these things are going to have to come. And, it, and he says, but that won't be all. That'll just be the birth pains. Then he goes through more. And then he basically comes down to this point where he says, the generation that sees all of that happen, that will be the generation that lives through it all, okay? You can go back and correlate it to Joel chapter three when he tells us when the end time clock would start ticking. And he said in Joel chapter three, it would be when all the people of Israel came back to their homeland and they were established as a nation. Does anybody know what year that was that that happened? 1948, okay? So the end time clock started ticking in 1948 and the Bible says that the generation that would see that happen is the generation that will see Jesus come back. You can go to Psalms chapter 90 and you can look and you can ask yourself, well, how long is a generation? And when you study Psalms 90, it'll tell you that now a generation is between 70 to 80 years. You do the math as to where we are right now, or Brandon can throw it on the screen for you. But either way, between 2018 and 2028 is that generation. So now you understand how it's very timely to understand that the end time clock is ticking. Prophetically, there's nothing that still needs to be fulfilled in the word of God before Jesus comes back. The book of Amos tells us that nothing that God does, he would do without revealing it first to the prophets, which tells us that everything that was going to happen prophetically is all written right here. It's just a matter of whether or not we're willing to get in and study it and understand it, all right? And so very quickly, I wanna just point out to you a couple things, and that is the event that is next up on the prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church, okay? You can go to 1 Thessalonians, I'm not gonna read it, but 1 Thessalonians chapter four, you can read verses 16 through 18 and it talks about a day coming when he is going to come back and the dead in Christ are gonna rise first. It says that the trump of God is gonna sound, the dead in Christ are gonna rise and those of us who are still alive and remain will be caught up, which is where we get the word rapture, in the air with Jesus, all right? That's the next event we're looking for. Well, we just told you that Rosh Hashanah is actually the feast of what? Good. If you didn't remember anything, you're going to remember that, all right? And then we just looked at the rapture passage in 1 Thessalonians says that there's going to be the trump of God. So we see this correlation of the trumpet, but that's not all. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this one I'm going to read, 15 verses 51 and 52, it says this. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will be transformed. It will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye when the last trump is blown. When the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to new life forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. That says at the last trump in the twinkling of an eye. Well, what you need to understand about the Feast of Trumpets that's even happening this weekend is that during that event, a trumpet or a shofar or a ram's horn, okay? I'm not gonna blow this because I would probably embarrass myself. But that, Brad and I went to Israel in 2011 and we bought one to bring back and have in our office. But the high priest or the priest, they would blow nine times throughout the day. They would grab a hold of the trumpet. They would grab the shofar and they would blast it 11 times. Nine times throughout the day, 11 blasts. Nine times 11 is how many? Now you're like, I didn't come to church to do math. Well, I'm keeping you awake, okay? 99. Well, when we study out the Feast of Trumpets, it says that this holiday, they would blast the trumpet 100 times during that holiday, okay? So it was a tradition, just like your Thanksgiving turkey. It was a tradition that God told them what to do. Well, on that 100th blast, it was the longest and the loudest trumpet blast you look at 1 Corinthians, it says at the last trump, at the last trump, many theologians, and we're in that pack of people who believe that one day, one day during the feast of trumpets, Jesus is coming back for his church. And you say, well, well now hold on, Misty, in Matthew chapter 24, didn't it say that no man knows the day or the hour? You're exactly right. You know your Bible. It does. But how many days did I tell you the feast of trumpets was? I'm helping you out too. 
So we still don't know the day and we don't know the hour. So here's why we wanted to bring you this timely word today. Because this weekend is the Feast of Trumpets. That's why the Tipping Point Prophecy Conference is going on. So by the way, this Saturday, if you want to go, you can still grab tickets, jump on the app. Next Sunday, don't show up on campus because we're going to be all online because most of us are going to be in Dallas for that event. But I want to tell you that next weekend is the Feast of Trumpets. Am I saying Jesus is coming back? No, I'm not saying he's coming back next week, but I'm saying he very well could. could. I also want to tell you he can come at any moment that he wants to. Because when God says it's time to go, it's time to go. And here's what you need to do is you and I need to live on guard. Guys, we are in a day and a time where there's nothing else that needs to be fulfilled. Never in my lifetime have I been on the edge of my seat more than I am right now. There's not a day that doesn't go by that I'm not highly concerned for any person I know. My loved ones, my family, my people I don't even like that I don't think are right with Jesus because he is coming back. It could be any moment, all right? So there's two things as we wrap this up today that I wanna tell you, if you're gonna live on guard, here's what you need to do. Number one, you need to guard your heart against sin period. The Bible says in John 10 and 10 that there's an enemy and he comes, but to still kill and destroy. But we live in a world where the enemy tries to tell everybody anything goes, whatever your flesh desires, do that. Okay. But the Bible says the exact opposite. Romans 6 and 12 says, do not let sin control the way you live. You can read the rest of this passage. But the fact is, guys, we've got to guard our life and our heart against sin. And not just one time, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. But in every day, waking up every moment and saying, God, like like King David, he said, search my heart. God, search my heart and know me. Show me if there be anything in me that is unclean. Show me if there's anything that needs to go, any attitudes, any actions, anything I'm doing, God, that would displease you. I want it out of my life. Guys, the Bible says that Jesus is coming back for a pure and a spotless bride. Like, I don't know what we're messing around with because we think to ourselves, we've got time. And even now, some of you are probably thinking, you, you're crazy. You are crazy. Listen to me. I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to take a chance. I'm just not. Jesus is coming back. And it's time that we live on guard. The second thing we have to do is guard our heart against the lies and deception of the enemy. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 says, Satan, who is the God of this world, he has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. That's the gospel of Jesus. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Guys, we live in a world today where the enemy has deceived so many people that what is evil they call good. And what is good is now being called evil. I'm gonna end today by reading you a few statements and I want you to just ponder within your mind, are these lies or are these truths according to the word of God? These are things that are being said today in the culture that we live. You only live once, YOLO. So you better live your best life. How many have seen that hashtag? Live in my best life. All religions lead to heaven. Remember, you're deciding in your mind, is this Bible or is this a lie that the enemy has put out? Everyone is special and fine just the way they are. We don't have to answer to anyone but ourselves. I'm my own boss. Love is all that matters in this world. The Bible is outdated. It's irrelevant. Besides, it was written by men anyway. So it's not the authoritative word of God. Happiness is the ultimate goal in life. You should always follow your heart. Oh, that's what Hallmark says. You should always follow your heart, your dreams, and your passions, no matter what. Jesus was just a great man, a prophet, but he was not God. Sin is is not a nature that was passed down to all mankind because God created us all good. We shouldn't care about what happens after we die because heaven and hell, they don't really exist. There's no such thing as objective truth. 
So we live our own truth, whatever we determine that to be. Christians should accept any and all things that culture and society deem as acceptable, even if it goes against what the Bible teaches. Every individual Christian can determine their own definition of what it means to be Christian. When it comes to identity, our gender, race, sexuality, political affiliation are more important than who we are in Christ. Now, I ask you to determine whether these are lies or if they are the truth. And I'll just tell you for the sake of time, every single statement I just read is a lie. According to the word of God, there wasn't any truth in what I just read, and yet that's what our culture is telling us. Church, it's time for us to be ready for the soon coming return of Jesus. Matthew 24, 44 says, you must be ready. Say, be ready. Be ready all the time for the son of man will come when we least expect it. It's time for the church to be the pure spotless bride that Jesus is coming back for. It's time for us to get serious about living on guard. It's time for us to get serious about being ready and making sure that all of those around us are ready to go. If, if this message, as brief as it was, interested you, we cut about a third of today's message out just now. So if you're highly interested and you want to know more, stick around for third service and we'll see if God allows us more time to share it. There is a lot that points towards the Feast of Trumpets being strongly affiliated with the rapture of the church. One thing in particular being, just to pique your interest a little more, is that many people call the Feast of, of Trumpets, actually they refer to it as the day that no one knows which is directly tied right back to the scripture that says he will come at a day or an hour that no one knows. So guys, there's so much weight here. There's so much pointing to this. And we're not, we're not giving dates or times in that we're saying Jesus is coming back this weekend. He could come back June 13th if he wants. He can do whatever he wants. He's God. We're not saying what he's going to do, but we're saying what the, the Bible very clearly shows us what he very well may do. And we all, as Misty said, we need to be ready. We need to be repentant. We need to live right. We need to live live. It, 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 we need to get to a point to where we are so serious about sin that we just, we gotta, we gotta be done playing patty cake with lifestyle. You get, this is the time where you've got to survey your life like David did and say, God, search my heart, know me. Look at your life, look at your thoughts and, and, and ask yourself, am I ready to go? Because there's a parable we didn't share today where Jesus prophesied that many people, many people in the last days who thought they were saved and going in the rapture will be left behind because they weren't right with God. I'm not trying to scare you, but a good pastor would ask this question. Are you one of them? It's quiet. That's good. I want you to search your heart. I want you to know the condition of your heart. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit about your lifestyle and about how you're living. And I want you to ask him if you're ready. And if there's any doubt in your mind that you're not ready, do whatever you can possibly do to get ready because there's a lot of people that don't know Jesus and time is so very short. We have to get the harvest, pull them in and help as many people as possible know who Jesus is. We're living in the last days. Let's pray today. Father, we are grateful for your word. Grateful God that you gave us so many details and hints and clues and, and mysteries, God, to your word that you've revealed to your people for these days. We're grateful God that you, you painted this picture of, of a season and you, you revealed to us who Jesus really is through your word. I pray today, God, that, that today's word, today's seed would be planted deep in our hearts and that it would take root and that it would produce a crop a hundredfold more, God, than the seed that had been planted. I pray, God, that we as your church would begin to truly grow by recognizing the signs of the times and getting our hearts ready, learning how to truly live on guard for you because the enemy is roaming about like a lion seeking whom he may devour in these last days. So God, get us ready. Help us to be ready. Help us to be your church in these end times. 
you know, if you've heard this message, your heart's stirring right now, you know, the first question that you should really ask yourself is, am I right with God? Do I have a real relationship with Jesus? That's the question. That's the first thing that needs to happen is you need to not have religion, but you need to have relationship. And that happens by simply acknowledging to God that you're a sinner. We're all sinners and we're drawn away and enticed by our sins. But God says, if we will just admit our sins to him and ask for forgiveness, that he is quick to forgive us. We have to believe in our heart that Jesus truly is who he says he is. He's the son of God and it's only through him that we can be saved. We have to believe that. We have to confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that requires transformation. It's not just an idea in your mind. It's a lifestyle change. When you make Jesus Lord of your life, you think differently and you behave differently. You act differently. You speak differently. Everything begins to change. So we invite you to admit and believe and confess today and make Jesus Lord. In this room, if your heart's stirring right now and you're making that decision, I just wanna encourage you right now to raise your hand. I wanna know who you are because we're gonna pray together as a church in support of those of you making this decision. Amen, thank you. Raise your hand good and high. I see your hand, brother, on my left and towards the back. Thank you. I see your hand on the right. Thank you up front. I see you up in the bleachers. Amen. Anybody else today, raise your hand. You say, I need to know Jesus. I wanna be made right with God. I wanna be ready when he returns. If you're watching online today, thank you. Up in the middle, in the back, I see you. If you're watching online today, I want you to comment all in in the comment section below, if that's you today. And we're gonna pray this prayer right now as a church in support of those making this decision. Father, I recognize today that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I ask that you would forgive me. I believe with all my heart, Jesus is the son of God. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Transform me, mold me, make me who you want me to be as I serve you wholeheartedly from this day forward in Jesus' name. Amen.